Okay. Without further delay, I will introduce our next USDA Think Water Fellow, Shailene Collins, who's going to talk about her research in Kenya on water insecurity. So, show her some love. Got to keep it going. There you go. Good afternoon. My name is Shailene Collins, and I am delighted to be here sharing my research today using systems thinking to explore the lived experiences of water insecurity in so before we get started, I'd like to point out an indicator in the bottom right hand corner of the different um, goals within system thinking that I use um, for each slide. So first, let's define what water insecurity is. And in system thinking, we would call this distinction, right? Or what something is or is not. So water insecurity exists, or water security, excuse me, exists when all people at all times have access to safe and sufficient water for a healthy and effective life. So water insecurity then exists when one or all of these parts are missing. And we know that water insecurity is a part of the system um, predicated on three components. So access, how, and where you get your water. Safety, can you safely fetch it? And is it safe to drink and use? And then sufficiency, so is there enough of it for my daily needs, for my household daily needs? And all of these are necessary for a healthy and productive life. But we also know that water insecurity is a wicked problem. And I'll talk about why. But first, let's talk about what water insecurity is not. So to further distinguish water insecurity, we need to talk about some of the issues that we face with it. So water insecurity is not easily measured. While there are numerous scales to quantify water insecurity, um, and you'll see many of those here. There's no one universally agreed upon metric by which we can quantify just how water insecure households are or begin to solve the problem. Water insecurity is also not rigorously monitored. So because we as scientific, programmatic, and policy communities do not agree upon how best to measure water insecurity, we cannot critically monitor changes in how water insecure households or respond in a meaningful way. Therefore, water insecurity is often quantified by proxy indicators, such as hand washing, prevalence of waterborne disease, and household water source. And certainly these are all components of water insecurity, but overlook the system as a whole and prevent us from, mon from monitoring changes and quantifying the impact of our evaluation and intervention. And lastly, water insecurity is not well understood. Thank you. Um, and my research focus is here. So we know that water insecurity is a wicked problem. As I said, it impacts nearly 2 billion people of the 7 billion people worldwide. Um, it likely has consequences that extend across the population and has impacts in nutrition and food security, energy security, um, physical and psychological health, just, you know, myriad consequences. And the experiences of water insecurity at the individual and household level are largely overlooked. So the response of two water insecurity problems then becomes siloed into various sectors such as these, um, each with their own perspectives or points and views about what water insecurity is and is not, and solutions on how to solve the problem. So why does water insecurity continue to be a wicked problem? Well, we think it's because approaches to solving water insecurity are often linear, which limit our understanding significantly, or the whole system is lost in the minutia of the parts that comprise it and the consequences that arise as a result of it. So to better understand how water insecurity um, affects individuals at the household level and the day-to-day -day experiences of women who are primarily responsible for carrying the majority of water-related tasks and water acquisition in places like Kenya, where my work is conducted, we use three methodological approaches. The first was photo voice, which you can see highlighted here. Um, photo voice is a participatory photo elicitation method where we provide participants with cameras and have them take photos of um, items around a central theme. So in this case, the central theme was water insecurity. They then discuss those photos or the most relevant photos in um, 
uh, a close description of those years. Secondly, we used pile sorting where we provided women with laminated illustrated cards um, with various water related tasks and a male and female figure and asked them to rank water insecurity uh, or rank water related household chores by um, difficulty, amount of water required to do them, and how um, who within the household was responsible for carrying out this. And lastly, we use go along interviewing, which is an in depth ethnographic methodology where participants were accompanied by an anthropologist while they gathered water and performed household um, water related chores. And what we found is that while water insecurity is often portrayed as a woman fetching water, and I'm sure many of you have seen pictures similar to this, when we broadened our perspective, we realized that actually that's a very small part of the whole of what, what's going on. And that the experiences of water insecurity are much less reductive than access safety insecurity. So while many working in the field of water insecurity, myself included, uh, critically considered insufficiency of water to be the primary driver of water insecurity. In our interviews, women discussed many barriers preventing their households from being um, water secure. So I'd like to walk through this with you as if you were in a qualitative interview. If we consider this photo alone, you can see that there are numerous hazards, um, such as fear of being attacked by brushy vegetation uh, or in brushy vegetation by people or animals is often discussed. Um, slipping and falling on rocks, you can see those here. Um, contamination of water or potential insecurity from people bathing, washing clothes, being swept away by the current, quite strong. Um, and just the burden of carrying dairy cans. It's heavy, you know, dairy cans back and forth many times per day um, to and from the source to have sufficient water for the household. So even something that seems as simple as fetching water is richly textured and includes multiple social, physical, and psychosocial and economic underlying factors. So I know you're one, I know you're now wondering how a systems thinking shaped my perspective about water insecurity. Well, systems thinking has allowed me to map findings from our qualitative interviews that are incredibly nuanced into a navigable framework of distinctions in blue, or what water insecurity is or isn't. Relationships, it's in green, or how these components work with one another synergistically. And all of this from the perspective of water insecurity highlighted in gray, which wholly form a system that I can use to understand the data myself and share these results with others. So I should note that my previous uh, and ongoing work also focuses on food insecurity. So one major challenge I face and structuring my thinking was untangling this inextricably linked um, relationship between food and water insecurity. Similarly, the causes and consequences of water insecurity are often linked and are also not the same. From an academic and programmatic perspective, our thinking about how to solve complex, often interwoven development challenges, such as water insecurity, to be framed in this way, as in, this way, um, because it parses out the relationships between food and water insecurity and the causes and consequences of water insecurity. It allows us to expand the part whole system within the larger structure of water insecurity. It gives us a unique opportunity to take on multiple perceptions and expands our definition of what water insecurity is and is not. And structuring the subtleties that were discussed in our interviews into uh, a workable and fractal mental model is useful for many reasons, but mainly because my work is human centric. Um, these data are only effective if they're mirrored back to the people that we work with and provide information for developing sustainable community driven solutions to complex problems. So in conclusion, water insecurity is a complex adaptive system with multiple parts. And to move forward in understanding this big problem effectively, we have to realize that the causes and consequences of water insecurity are multifactorial. Therefore, I think these can similarly be structured in a way that encompasses all of the experience of water insecurity. And I'd like to thank our study participants, without whom some of these beautiful photos would not have been taken. Um, the Young Research Group for Maternal and Child Nutrition and Dr. Sarah Young, ICI, the Cabrera Research Lab, 